Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, you may share, support, and subscribe. You may subscribe wherever it is that you are hearing this message broadcasted to you. You may share the very words of God you hear and the link to wherever you are accessing it from. And finally, you may support by signing up for the newsletter, aksum.substack.com, and or contributing at any level over at patreon.com slash tawahado, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. So we have completed what are, according to the good is right, liturgical rubric and gusawe or lectionary, the scheduled readings for the associate deacon from James or Jacob through John's revelation, which we are unabashed in accepting. And indeed on Pascha or Tensai on the resurrection on Easter, we read in its entirety. So now my goal is to go through the Pauline epistles and to do so canonically. So I am beginning with Romans, and here we see the assault upon that great imperial capital of yesteryear, Rome. It is considered, you know, the biggest site in the western end or extremity of the earth in the time period of the biblical authors. And so taking out the spiritual sword, which is the word of God, and slaying this beast seeing as we just got out of Revelation, slaying this beast would be a good idea for making sure the good news gets to every category of human being to represent the totality and universality and omnipresence of the God of Scripture. So let's get to it. Romans 1, verses 1 to 7. Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever I talk about the Pauline corpus, I like to get into it around the name of Paul. For the Amharic speakers, readers, and writers in the audience and attendance, we have this wonderful word that I think is the greatest translation, but nobody uses it for Paul. And that is to say, mamush. Paul or Paulos or Bulos, if you switch the P to a B, is this Latinized greco-roman we can say version of the word little so this is the belittled one this is the little one the midget the dwarf the little person it's to be in contradistinction with anyone who would like to call him the great paul the great little one the great dwarf it doesn't quite make sense it's kind of how in street culture in the united states people go by aliases that are you know supposed to be ironic you know if you're light-skinned you'll be called darky if you're you know a chubby boy you'll be called tiny and it's supposed to throw the police and other authorities off of your trail and to give you a chance of survival this is not quite that but this is to belittle paul to humble him so he doesn't get to stick with his jewish name of saul it's the same name as the king who was asked for by the people who wanted to resemble the nations. Instead, after his conversion to Christianity, he is called Paul. He is the belittled one. He is the little one, or I like to say, mamush in the Amharic. He is also here a servant 
or a bond servant, more precisely, what is called a slave. I usually avoid the slave language, not to take away the power of the word, but because slave is tied to the ethnic group Slav, but a lot of people miss that. So anyway, you'll see me going back and forth between bond servant and slave mostly, and that's an argument with myself. But the point being, he is bound by the word. He is belittled and he is bound. And he is an apostle, meaning he is one who is sent forth. That makes him a henchman and a minion. And he starts this assault upon Rome, that great imperial capital, with this banger of the resurrection. We are in a, an age, an era, in which some people are even clergies in various Christian denominations, where they think that faith or trust in the resurrection is optional. It is not optional, but it is also not just something to dwell on in theory, but it is something to live out in our lives. It's something that is in praxis, in practice. And so we will see that. I myself had a little bit of a faith crisis in college where I was confronted with the idea of Jesus and I had to pick to either reject or accept his message. And one of the things I found in the deepest corners of my mind, I wasn't raised overly religious, let's say, but always a cradle Orthodox Christian, was sent to a Lutheran middle school, um, you know, was exposed to various forms of, of racism and hypocrisy in the church and and was read biblical stories growing up but was never an every sunday christian i was a a, a pascha or easter a, a theophany or the baptism of the lord and a christmas type of christian and i would go every month or every other up month with one of my aunts or with another and with my cousin and in college i was particularly interested in various philosophies and one of them in the American strain of transcendentalism, including Emerson and Thoreau, had this idea of getting rid of every received tradition you've ever had to think critically of it. And I did so. But the one thing I could not shake from my mind was the resurrection. And it's not so that I could go boast about how great my belief in the resurrection was, but then to be confronted with the idea that in response to the resurrection, I need to live a life accordingly. And so that's what we'll see throughout the rest of the chapter. What I'll touch on and what I use in my emails often here is the charis and the ireni. Charis is the word for grace, unmerited favor. It is a gift from God. And the irene, you'll see this in Greek and also because they've adopted through the loan word in the Coptic tradition. Uh, and in fact, even in American culture, anyone named Irene, this is the Greek word for peace. But I also like to point to the Hebrew, which is always the subtext in the New Testament, which is shalom. And shalom refers to you being whole, you being complete. And when you are whole and when you're complete, that's when you have peace. So the charis and the shalom, the grace and the peace is being wished upon all of the hearers of this epistle, which is to be read aloud in the communities that Paul established and every community until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he will judge all those who've ever lived and all those who've ever died. Verses 8 to 15. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me, now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. 
so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. One of my favorite things here, I mentioned it when we covered James slash Jacob chapter 4, but here in Romans chapter 1 and in James chapter 4, or J Jacob chapter 4 as I, as I called it, but I don't want to be too obtuse here, the key insight of Muslims, which we can draw upon, is the usage of the Arabic word inshallah, which means God willing, Lord willing. Whenever we are talking about future events, right here, even the Apostle Paul talking about future events with whatever revelations he was given, says according to God's will, he says, inshallah, he says, God willing. And that is the mentality that we need to have. And it is a level of humility and lowliness to approaching future events that are not under our control. And this may anger some people who want to try to plan out every little millisecond and nanosecond of the future. But that is not given to us. It is uh, not under our purview. And so it's not for us to decide, but it's in God's hands and in God's hands alone. Then I like to see that he's requesting to link up to them face to face for mutual encouragement. And of course, the mutual encouragement between a senior and a junior is with the senior speaking and the junior listening actively with ears that hear. You hear this distinction between the Greeks and the barbarians, the Hellens or the Hellenists and the Barbaros, the wise and the foolish. The, the, this is to refer to two different groups. How I define this here is high culture and low culture. So in this time period, and then we'll draw upon our own, in this time period, the Hellenistic culture spread by Alexander the Great is seen as the highest of culture, the highest of peak civilization. You have cities and beyond that you have writing and you have philosophy, you have symposiums, and you have all sorts of wisdom according to the Greeks. And then the barbarians are people like the Scythians mentioned in Colossians. And the Scythians are amongst many people from the steppe, like the later Mongols under Genghis Khan, who are horseback riders, sometimes called centaurs, because they look like the mythical creatures in that they're almost always from the time of their childhood riding horses and using their archery. And they're very fearsome warriors as cavalry. And they will, if you listen to Dan Carlin's hardcore history, from time to time, creep into the modern day Balkans, creep into the Persian Empire, creep into the Babylonian Empire, and they will retreat when they have to back to Central Asia to around modern day Kazakhstan. And these barbaros or these barbarians are people without sort of established cities. They live like nomads. They live on the go. They live a life in the desert, a life in the wilderness, a life of uh, very few material needs, actually, um, besides the barbarism there is. And, and this is supposed to be the low culture. So if you think about American society today, if you are a reader of the New Yorker magazine and or the New York Times, but especially the New Yorker magazine, you are likely someone who is engaged in high culture in the United States. If you are someone who enjoys the UFC or some bare knuckle boxing, you are probably into the low culture of the United States. Whether you are from a high culture or a low culture, the gospel or the good news, the evangelion, is meant for you. And he, meaning Paul, the belittled one, Mamush, is a debtor to you to serve you until his final breath for the sake of his Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 16 to 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the just shall live by faith here is a quotation, actually, from Habakkuk chapter 2, 
And if I can be so bold as to give you homework, I would encourage you to read the chapter in its entirety. One of the things about grammar that makes it interesting is when I looked it up in one of the versions as I was preparing for this podcast episode, Habakkuk 2, when I actually saw the quote, it said faithfulness. So faith in him, his faith toward us, his faithfulness toward us. Sometimes some people could get tripped up on the grammar there. Um, it is to say that he has shown himself to be loyal to us, whether or not we are loyal to him. And he gives us a second chance, a second opportunity to be loyal to him. And we should take him up on that offer towards the end of chapter two. Uh, it's verse four where you find the actual quotation that, that Paul is using, but towards the end of the chapter, it, it's got this very powerful imagery about idols that I'm going to call upon for later. And this is a setup here. So I want to read it to you. What profit, if this is from verse 18 of chapter two of Habakkuk, what profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. So it's just powerful imagery from Habakkuk that there is no life. There is no breath. These idols of gold, silver, and wood cannot be told arise, as the deacon says in the liturgy. These idols are inanimate, and they're really devices to fool the public because the person who says that they trust in them or are loyal to them really just want to present their own teaching rather than the teaching of God. So the community of the Jews are a random sample of humankind from Adam and Eve, from life and the groundling, who's made from the dust of the ground, and they are granted salvation as a test population. But it's not just for the Jews, it's also extended to the Greeks or the Hellenists. And if it's extended to the Greeks, it's also extended to the Barbaros or the Barbarians. And then if it's extended to the nomadic Barbarians, it's even extended to those dark-skinned Ethiopians. And thus with the Jew, the Greek, the Barbarian, and the Ethiopian, you have every category of human being being offered the salvation that was given to the Jews. This is uh, Father Mark Bulos's message in the Torah to the Gentiles, his commentary on the book of Galatians. And you'll see throughout the you know text of Galatians and Romans, a lot of similarities, and we'll go back and forth and checking them out. And I'll be excited to get to Galatians when I get to it canonically. Verses 18 to 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. They confused the Creator with the creation, the Creator with the creature. 
I love Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, as much as anyone else, but I was startled one time when a member of the choir asked me, isn't it right for every time a psalm or a spiritual song is sung unto the Lord Jesus, that it is also sung unto Mary? And this type of question is one of those that get raised in various times in history because people are trying to find the right balance of piety. We need to make this clear. God is above all. He's totally distinct. He's set apart in taboo. That is what it means to be the creator. In the various philosophies of the age we are living in, people discuss energies and vibes, and most importantly to them, the universe. And for them, the cosmos, space and time itself is God. But for the Abrahamic faiths, God creates. God is the author and crafter. He is the crafter of the cosmos, the author of life. He makes space-time, and thus he's outside of it. And without getting too much into it, because I am not a Hellenist, but a Semite, God is totally different. And when we read Habakkuk chapter 2, we see the kind of prophetic age idolatry of making wood, gold, and silver idols. When we read about Moses going up to the mountain and Aaron and the others making a golden calf, we think, oh, we would never do that. We would never do that. And yet we're going to see here in what I've read in 18 to 25 and what I'm going to read in 26 to the end of Romans chapter 1, that there are various ways in which we too are building idols. And to build an idol is to be disloyal to God, to betray God, and to run after other gods, as is listed here. It is a revolt against nature and the God of nature. Verses 26 to the end. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, the plain teaching here, which is the elephant in the room in 2021, particularly for those of us who grew up in liberal and progressive backgrounds, is that the Bible rejects the LGBTQAI plus lifestyle. The way that it is expressed today is nowhere near what it was expressed in ancient times. In fact, it, it seems to be evolving every five years nowadays with the lexicon. And uh, we could probably point to the 1800s to the more monogamous forms of that particular type of extra marital affair. But it's not an isolation. There's a whole litany of evils listed here. And I don't know about you, but I don't know how often people go outside and protest and say, there's too much deceit. 
Or how many times do you see there are too many backbiters? There are too many gossipers, too many whisperers, says the KJV. Other versions say gossip, uh, gossipers. But too many whisperers. How many times do you see a protest led about people being too disobedient to parents? I, I just don't see it. Maybe it's there and I'm, I'm not hip to it. But each of these evils is an idol. The moment we decide that any of these teachings are superior to the teaching laid down to us by God, at that moment, we have turned a creation, a creature, into an equal with the creator, which, of course, is an impossibility. And so we've committed idolatry. I don't know what your sin is. You know what your sin is best. And in consultation with the priest of the Orthodox Church, I encourage you to try and learn how to identify and get rid of these. There is a, a Japanese word which you could even trace to General MacArthur in World War II of the United States, and it is behind the whole system that Toyota established in the world of lean manufacturing and then got pushed into the technology world in the United States and elsewhere with the Agile movement and Scrum. And the, that Japanese word is Kaizen. And Kaizen is about continuous improvement and refinement. This idea of aiming for excellence, aiming for perfection and finding some small detail to correct every day, making it manageable. Don't bite off more than you can chew but find where you are boastful, find where you are proud, find where you're debating too much, find where you're promoting murder or envy or whispering too much or malignant or covetousness, or if you deal with homosexuality or, or any of these things, disobedience to parents. Find a small scale version of it and try to rid yourself of it slowly over time. And you will be able to walk in his faithfulness, to walk in faith, to live like the righteous live by responding to the resurrection of Jesus Christ with a life that is worthy and becoming of it. Glory to God for all things.